Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here we are again uh, uh, with this uh, new appointment of uh, within the series that is called a new point of view. Uh, a new point of view is uh, um, a series of events online uh, meant to complement the physical shows, uh, which uh, in this uh, very moment are uh, thought to be uh, specifically devoted to Linapelle New York and Linapelle London, that unfortunately cannot take place physically uh, this year. Uh, it's a, a, a new strategy of uh, digital meeting within uh, um, uh, the, the concept of uh, digital fairs. We are now in uh, week two, uh, that, uh, uh, and the event is going to go on uh, for two more weeks until uh, uh, August 7. So um, uh, today I have the great pleasure to speak about uh, a topic that is interesting, I think, um, everybody in um, in, uh, in, our, in our world, that is uh, the post-COVID-19 sales processes. And uh, I have the great pleasure to host, uh, I would say, an old friend, <laughs> if I may say, <laughs> that is uh, Giordana Guimaraes. Uh, my name, of course, is Federico Brugnoli. I'm the curator of the Innovation Square at Lina Pelle. Uh, the Innovation Square took place already two times in 2018 and 2019, and we had the pleasure to have uh, Giordana uh, present at the Innovation Square as well. Um, Giordana is the co-founder of uh, Fashion Innovation at uh, NYC. Uh, I will have uh, her introducing herself briefly uh, before the start uh, of uh, our conversation. So, uh, just one uh, more point. Uh, it is very important to remind all of you that uh, uh, a new point of view is also uh, the name of uh, uh, the event that will take place physically this time uh, on 22nd and 23rd of September 2020 in Milano. It is uh, also a post-COVID-19 uh, event, but uh, the organizers are telling me that um, there is uh, already a, a great response from the market. So the invitation is uh, for those who will be able to do, to do so to attend it. Uh, so, without uh, further ado, I would like to um, uh, introduce you, uh, Jordana. Actually, Jordana, I would like you to introduce yourself, <laughs> basically, uh, because I think the audience is, uh, um, is eager to understand uh, what your background is and uh, why you are here to speak with us and why we have invited you. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Thank you, Federico, for the introduction. Thank you, Linnea Pelli, for having me on here. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Fashion Ovation, and Fashion Ovation is a multimedia platform as well as a conference where we bring together CEOs and founders of tech companies and fashion companies and just personas within the supply chain when it comes to the fashion industry to discuss the intersections that are helping shape the innovations behind the trends that we keep seeing in the industry. Um, and really not only do we speak about how do we improve the industry, but also how do we make the world a better place while doing so. Um, so that's what Fashion Innovation is. Thank you very much, uh, Jordana. Just uh, um, one more uh, operative uh, uh, information for the attendees. Uh, uh, Jordana, you and me will be speaking about these uh, six uh, questions that we have very carefully prepared. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, we just uh, uh, we just uh, had a, a brief conversation because we, we trust each other and we know that uh, the conversation will be smooth. But uh, I kindly ask the audience if they have uh, some questions uh, to just uh, type these questions in the Q&A session of the Zoom. Um, platform and uh, Jordan and I will try to respond to those questions provided that they're not too complex um, at the end of, uh, of uh, our conversation. So, well, Jordana, um, we have been speaking last week of uh, retail in particular. So, um, uh, we know that the world of uh, Lina Pelle uh, includes retail but is also uh, linked with the supply chain. Um, and the, the question is, what is the impact you are seeing on retail, and therefore the consequences on uh, on uh, on uh, on supply chain, uh, on which we will go 
more in detail later on. But um, uh, are you seeing a growing importance of uh, e-commerce? Which are the different perspectives of, uh, of brands? Uh, what is the behavior of uh, real estate in this situation? So that's a lot of questions in one question. So I'm going to go step by step. So um, first, when it comes to retail, obviously, we're seeing a lot of a lot of struggle, um, a lot of, you know, department stores going bankrupt and companies going bankrupt that are primarily just retail. Um, I think that the companies that let's call them fast fashion brands, um, you know, they had a huge problem. I mean, th all throughout the entire supply chain during COVID and that obviously took a big burden financially for the brands as well as for the retail locations. Um, and also because people weren't leaving their house. So I think, you know, I always say this, retail is not dead, retail is just changing. Um, so I think it's all about adaptation and experience and how do you minimize um, the stock that you keep um, in order to keep those retail stores going? Um, how do you innovate so that you don't have to have so much merchandise that eventually could just, you know, become waste? So those are all kind of key points that I see when I think of retail that needs to be changed um, in order for things to progress towards the next normal. Um, I think that we're also seeing a lot of brands that were primarily retail and had a lot of access inventory, like Diane von Furstenberg comes to mind. I'm wearing actually one of her dresses and so she's in my mind right now, but you look at what she did with closing all of her stores and going just e-commerce and taking the China-based e-commerce business model. And I think that's something that we might see a lot of other brands in that scale do um, just because they're having a hard time. With that being said, um, I do, in when it comes to inventory sitting in the warehouses or the manufacturing companies, et cetera, I see a lot of inventory philanthropy, which is what they're coining it to be, where they're trying to figure out ways to create new marketplaces. So going back to e-commerce, um, where they can have a lot of the brands get rid of that access inventory via ways of giving back, but still being able to make a profit to at least cover their expenses. Um, so that's something that I see. And I'm trying to think what else was in that question. So those are the two uh, things. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it is, uh, it is uh, um, very clear what you have said. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of uh, elaboration on, on brands. So there are different categories of brands uh, uh, if we're not talking about retailers as such. So the reference word of Lina Pelle is mainly working with uh, luxury brands which are different from uh, fast fashion ones. Yeah. So how do you see the reaction of uh, both categories of brands in, the, in this period? So it's interesting. I had a call recently with a really big, um, big tech company and they focus on made to order. Um, and they said that out of the 10 big luxury um, brands around the world, so they spoke about Kering or Meds, LVMH, all of these brands are starting to really go toward the made to order business model, which is interesting. I just learned that recently when I had a call with them. Um, and it makes sense because it all goes back to circularity in the supply chain and slow fashion and all of those things. So I feel like the luxury brands, the big ones that we think of when we think luxury, they're already, you know, shifting towards the made to order, slow, you know, process with slow fashion um, and not so I think that that's something that we're going to see a lot more of and I think that that's the way forward especially you know if you think sustainability um, so that's something that I see a lot being done when it comes to luxury. Um, there are so many interesting things that are coming up um, but uh, uh, regarding this a question that was not prepared Jordana so I'm, I'm not going to be bad. <laughs> But um, uh, when we speak about made to order, uh, when we speak about uh, uh, this shift of uh, model of brands, uh, are we, uh, do you think that the world is going or this, the, 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 the fashion world is going uh, at least in this segment towards also higher quality in general? And uh, let, me, let me just conclude. Um, if you remember, we had a conversation in the past uh, uh, and the topic was uh, from mass production to quality and care and durability of products. Is this something that is increasing in this moment? Yes, 
I see that. I mean, when you have something that is made throughout the entire supply chain, once again, in a sustainable format, whether it's like, you know, who's making it, how they're making it, um, how they're being treated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes from the very beginning to the end. And then you add in there the major order and the different textiles that are coming out in order for it to last longer, but also getting rid of waste. I think the reason why sustainability personally hasn't been something that got adopted by the masses is because one, people didn't understand sustainability. It was a big term for a lot of people, which I think now we're defining it more and more as we kind of compact the supply chain. But I also think that two, it was too expensive for a lot of people because it makes sense there wasn't enough demand for it. But I think that now that we're seeing all of the brands really know that they have to lead in that direction in order to survive, in order to be able to be around for a while, for a lot longer. I think that now the demand is going to get higher. So the price is going to go down. And I think the quality is going to get higher. So I do see that happening. Obviously, it's going to take a while. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, but I think we're going towards that direction. So for me, that's exciting to see, you know, and I do think the qualities are going to get a lot better because I think fast, you know, right. So like right after COVID, so let's say post COVID, obviously people are going to be suffering financially. So do I see them lining up at Zara and H&M and those stores to shop? Yes. But at the same time, I think that a lot of people that are going to be struggling financially, maybe they'll think twice about buying 20 of something and just buy one thing that's going to last a very long time. Because I think for the first time also fashion being online, it's accessible to everybody now. So we're finally starting to get to fashion being inclusive. And the minute that happens, consumers are going to get educated. And I think that that's going to allow the you know brands to create better products better quality and sell it for a price that people can afford. And just uh, to complement what you're saying, um, it is my opinion that the reference market of the luxury business is not going to suffer financially as much as the reference market of the, let's say, fast fashion market. So mm -hmm. if, uh, if I have to make a, let's say, I'm guessing projection. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's that probably in in uh, in the midterm uh, uh, by midterm we mean months in this case. Um, the the fast fashion is gonna suffer more than um, than the luxury. Meaning yes. that uh, uh, yeah, it is still true that uh, uh, a t-shirt may cost uh, twenty dollars or a pair of shoes may cost thirty. But uh, it is more difficult that those that are losing their jobs uh, may afford $30 for a pair of shoes rather than those who are, let's say, um, in, in the 1% of the world population that, that is uh, really looking at, uh, at luxury. Uh, they may pick up from some of their money from their reserves, I would say. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is just... Uh, to complement on that, but uh, in, in general, uh, I, I agree with you and, uh, and I see in, gen in, in uh, overall a trend uh, of uh, people going back to the, uh, to the concept of uh, using a product for, for a long time and make it personal. Yeah. Um, we had a presentation last week in which, on sustainability actually, in which I was showing that for the first time in history, there, were a pair, there, was a, there is a pair of shoes uh, let's say leather shoes uh, on the market that costs less than a Big Mac menu. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So that, that is uh, the insanity of uh, some kind of uh, portion of market and where they're going to. Um, Jordana, more on retail, uh, and then maybe we can speak about the consequences on the supply chain, but uh, do you see then um, uh, 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 a sudden acceleration of uh, new sales platforms. We have a, a or uh, new sales apps, uh, a link oh, yeah. to commerce. We have a common friend, Jacqueline, that is developing a, a very interesting app that is guiding consumers toward uh, e-commerce. So I will let you answer this question and maybe I will elaborate a little bit on uh, 
which are the consequences on platforms for the provision of materials and components for these e-commerce platforms? Yeah, no, so I do. So it's interesting. Um, I've had a few calls and I keep going back to the calls I've had because I have people that are calling me with all of these innovations and this is how I'm seeing kind of what people are thinking. Um, so for example, I spoke to a phenomenal woman. Um, she was actually the senior vice president at Alexander Wang for a long time, and then she left and started an app just late last year um, to put everything when it comes to the wholesale Omni buyers. She put the entire thing, the entire process on an app so that you just use this one app and everything you need to know about the brand, the collection, what's available to purchase, it's on the app. I saw the same thing when it comes to digitalization of e-commerce and brands. Um, there's, you know, people that are really using apps now and technologies to be able to do the whole offline, online digitalization of brands. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of that. Um, I'm also seeing just a lot of platforms when it comes, you mentioned briefly like materials and manufacturing, but there are a lot of platforms that already have been in existence for a while, but I think they're coming more to play now when you can do the entire thing online um, when it comes to choosing the right manufacturer, to choosing the right textiles, to making sure that it's sustainable, to have the whole process done for you just in one platform. So all of that, I think is, we're seeing a lot of everything going online. Um, and again, I always go back to online, offline, but I do think that there's there is a big sprint towards all of these technologies to assist all of that being done. Um, so more and more, I'm seeing them come to play and in addition to the ones that already exist. Mm -hmm. So those are the things I see. I would say digitalization, um, online platforms for wholesale purchases, online platforms for manufacturing choices, textiles, everything. There's so many apps that are being developed now where you can do the entire process from A to Z in the supply chain on using just the technology. So I do see a lot of that. Um, isn't it a danger, Jordana, that there are so many platforms being developed in parallel? So at yeah. the end of the day, we know that, we know that the, the, the big game and the, and the big question is how to standardize processes, no? Um, yeah. Uh, so, if, if there is a, a, an app that is speaking a language and then another app that is speaking another language, then how, how are supply chains going to be organized? Uh, who's going to win this battle? Yeah, and I, yeah, that's a good question. I don't really have even an answer no, no, no. to that because I mean, it is a problem. Open question. No, for sure. Yeah, I agree. No, I totally agree. And I also think that with so many people competing to be in the same space because of the surge that is like, has escalated all of a sudden with people needing these services at their fingertips. It is something that's going to be very, I think it can get really messy if people don't really start to kind of compact everything into one thing that can be almost like universal. Yes. Um, but yeah. I mean, we have the parallel in, uh, if, uh, if someone is in an Android system or in an Apple system, but they are two players, right? And here yeah. we're talking about a multitude of players everyone having his uh, own uh, language provision, uh, yeah. digital, uh, uh, digitalization platforms, and so on and so forth. So yeah. um, probably a huge effort on standardization would be required uh, in the near future. Yeah. <laughs> if, if this model will, will, will take over. So yeah. um, um, uh, according to what we have said until now, uh, let's focus a little bit on uh, supply chains. So let's put ourselves in the in the in the shoes of uh, uh, of the suppliers of brands, uh, those who are producing materials, components, and also those who are manufacturing uh, parts of the product. Um, what do you think their most important innovation should be in terms of uh, organizational model, perhaps, uh, or new ways of proposing materials? Do you see? also a, a possibility of digitalization of materials uh, in the fashion business in which, uh, uh, yeah, to the, 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 the visual aspect is important, but also the feel and the smell yeah. as important. Yeah. Um, uh, do you see uh, new ways of proposing style evolutions, for example? 
So I think that when it comes to textiles, so it's interesting. Um, I had a call yesterday. I go back to the calls. Um, <laughs> with the, <laughs> are you familiar with Evolve by Nature? So yeah, Evolve by Nature, yeah. So I spoke with them yesterday, and they're doing some incredible things when it comes to chemicals for textiles and just different things that they're going to start you know, doing, especially post-COVID when it comes to just making sure that everything is protected within that textile or even clean beauty, you know, just chemicals, chemicals, but good chemicals that can actually enhance the productivity and what the textile does. Um, and that goes, I think of Evolve by Nature, I think of Bolt Threads, I think of Evernew. There's a lot of companies that are really using, you know, different, I guess, scientific, and this is out of my realm, this is more you, yeah. but I know that this is being done a lot. Um, I also think, you know, when it comes to printing, like you said, it's good to touch, feel, smell of fabric. Um, but I do think that like the whole 3D um, printing um, is something that, you know, we're hearing a lot of. We're not seeing so much of it, I think yet, but we're hearing a lot of it. Um, so I don't know if that's something that maybe the reason we're not seeing it is because there is something about that real textile. So that's something that's going to be interesting to see. Um, I think when it comes to manufacturing, again, my only worry with the manufacturing um, is that I really don't see, even if we have another 10 years of this happening, I don't see more than 10 years from now, people still manufacturing in the masses. I really do see a lot of, again, I'm going to go back to pre-order, made-to-order, um, slow fashion, creating a few pieces at a time. So that's going to be an interesting shift to see like how exactly that's going to play out when it comes to the manufacturers and when it comes to all of the jobs and, you know, everything that that employs. So that's something interesting um, that I do see a big change coming soon and it's already starting. Um, yeah. I, no, I, 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 have, I have a couple of hints uh, to, to complement and then maybe you can re-elaborate on, on what, what I'm saying. So I, I was just taking notes, uh, Jordana, when you were speaking. No, minimize stock, make to order. Um, uh, so this, I think that from the manufacturing point of view, this is the, very, the, the real shift and the real evolution in the organizational and business model. So uh, we have companies uh, in the leather world, uh, that is the main reference world for, for uh, Lina Pelle, that have uh, organized their production plants with you know, big machines that are meant to increase productivity. But this also means big lots. And big lots means big stocks. And big stocks means uh, that the orders have to be big. But probably in, in this way, in this, uh, kind of scenario that we're de depicting, the the average size of orders of material is going to be decreasing, or um, for them is going to be important for the production uh, guys is going to be important to to find a way to neutralize the semi-processed material as uh, as close as possible to the finished product, so that uh, another real important parameter that is the lead time. I mean, if you are speaking about made to order, someone has to, has, has to have the stock. If yeah. the producer or the, or the, or the customer that is, uh, the, 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 let's say the consumer facing company, someone has to stock something. Yeah. So um, the, the idea that we are developing is that uh, it, it would be helpful to support companies to be able to um, neutralize products. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking about materials and then finish them in a very short period of time and then be able to deliver so that the made to order process is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And um, uh, yeah, and this is also linked uh, again, one more time to sustainability because it means that you are working on uh, processes that are producing yeah. environmental impacts only when they're truly necessary. Definitely, mm -hmm. yes. So, um, and this leads me to uh, the last set of two questions uh, that uh, I have for you. Um, uh, COVID-19 has had a great impact on mobility of persons. So, uh, uh, do you see this uh, supporting a kind of deglobalization scenario in terms of production? Uh, are uh, 
local craftsmanship and, and local production concentrated in specific areas going to be an advantage, uh, going to have or to profit from an advantage to that. Just think about it. Uh, I am a big brand and I need a supply and I need to do a product development. And instead of uh, doing this product uh, in uh, Italy plus Romania plus China plus whatever, I do everything in one country where mobility is ensured, uh, the rules are all the same and so on and so forth. So is this like a situation going to create a risk that uh, big customers would like to avoid by going back to local craftsmanship and local production models? Mm. Part of me says some yes. It's tough. It's hard because a really, so the bigger brands, the bigger companies, um, as much as that would be like, it would be beautiful, right? For everybody to like support locally and do locally and all of that. I think that's really hard for a big brand to do um, a lot of times uh, because there isn't enough, even if the demand was there for that to happen, it, it would need to create, we would need to start creating structure, right? There's a lot of local places, like places. I don't know, around sorry. I, I, I'm speaking about a local production system serving a global market. Yeah, I think yes. And I also think that it's not going to fully be that. I think a lot of it is going to go that route, but I still think that some people are going to have to go to other countries for certain things. I think there is, I think there's always going to be a little bit of like, you know, a global aspect to the bigger brands and even to the, some small brands that, you know, some people need to go to separate different countries for what they're, for the riches that they have that maybe locally you don't have. Does that make sense? Yes. So I think that like, I think it will happen quite a bit, but I still think we're going to see global type of um, supply chains when it comes to the process and the manufacturing and the creation of things. But I think people will start to try to do as much as they can when it comes to local supply chains. And when it comes to more, you know, craftsmanship, artisanal type work, et cetera. But I still think that there, I think there's going to be a mix. I think people are going to start to try to not have everything, maybe someone that would do everything outsourcing. I think they're going to start to try to keep it local, some of the things, but I don't think, I don't think it's feasible for a big, it's going to, if that's the case, I think it would take a while, but I think that it would, it would be tough to do like within a, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I'm trying to think, no, no, that it does uh, very much have to do with the market segmentation. Yeah. So, and, uh, if we're speaking about luxury or high-end products, uh, maybe made to measure, customized or high quality materials, then yeah. uh, this, this can happen yeah. easily. Exactly. In, in some cases, it is already happening. I know, I think you know that most of the luxury Leather goods are, are made in, in local production in the industrial districts here in Italy, for example. So even if uh, they are serving the global market, they are locally manufactured, all of them is here. So one model is this, uh, focused on, uh, on uh, high-end uh, quality products using high-end quality materials. And probably another, another model is the one of uh, um, uh, product development and rapid prototyping in local uh, in local communities, and then uh, distribution of uh, mass production globally. So um, I, I see these two possible evolutions, and I, I don't yeah. know if you agree with that. No, I do. I agree with that. I was just thinking out loud, like I was thinking in my head and processing the words as I was thinking about it because I was trying to visualize it, you know, with certain aspects of what the supply chain entails. But I think what you said makes complete sense to me too. Well, Jordana, as usual, it's always very interesting to, to speak with you. And uh, I hope the, that the audience was uh, interested as well. So I think we can open the, the Q&A question, uh, the Q&A session. Um, so if uh, anybody in the audience is interested to, to have some more details or to make us uh, even challenging uh, questions, we are here to <laughs> Just, uh, just for, for the audience, you have the, the Q&A um, icon on, uh, on Zoom. You just can click on that and type your question and then submit.
It's always uh, hard to start. We need, we need uh, an icebreaker, Jordan, and then uh, all the others will follow. Beth, I do, I, I do have to say, like, it's interesting because a lot of what I end up knowing or learning is just through, I kept saying call, 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 but because we are a platform, we get people from all over the world nowadays. Like, I have about 10 calls a day with people just throwing innovations at us. And through hearing what people are thinking, you know, you start to kind of see a pattern. And it seems that a lot of people, when it comes to what we spoke about with digitalization, e-commerce, retail, manufacturing, artisans, like it, it's very much, it's a lot of people talking about the same thing. So you start to kind of see kind of, you know, it, it's a, it's a yeah. trend, a lot of the things that I, we're seeing. I, I, I totally agree with you. The point is that they, they speak about the same titles, but with a different meaning. Yeah, so exactly. That's the problem. <laughs> retailer means something and digitalization for a producer means something else. Yeah. Um, it's many years that uh, we see the growing importance of uh, um, uh, shared design platforms uh, in which uh, a product can be co-designed uh, by different designers around the world. Uh, but uh, this hasn't been uh, deployed because uh, it was too easy to travel. And then maybe... Yeah these things are, are going to be changing uh, pretty fast. Yeah. I do have a question for you since no one's putting a Q&A for you, Federico. Sustainability in your mind um, with everything happening, since a lot of people say that, some people say sustainability will take a back seat post-COVID, some people say sustainability will take a front seat post-COVID, immediately post-COVID. What are your thoughts? Uh, as you know, Jordana, we are like a consulting boutique. We are a very small company. Uh, we have been able to work remotely and uh, uh, our systems allow us to, to work uh, in smart working. We never had so many requests on sustainability, sustainability projects, in particular in the lead world, as we did in this last period. So um, uh, uh, we, we had an, an interesting talk last week uh, here at the uh, Lina Pelle Innovation Talks uh, on sustainability. We also see that the sustainability topics are growing in number after this COVID-19. So we're not just speaking only anymore about uh, human rights, labor condition, environmental protection, and so on and so forth. But we're also speaking about new, new keywords like su supply chain solidarity. Yeah. Um, COVID has had a great impact on small and medium uh, businesses, uh, especially financially. So yeah. we expressed uh, and we have identified and invented this term of supply chain solidarity so that uh, uh, it, it has also to be taken into account that if you have a specific competence that is in a very nice company that is maybe 10 people but they have a tradition and a craftsmanship and everything that is important for your supply chain then maybe you as a big brand should support it even financially and pay in advance uh, so it, you, you know this kind of uh, uh, this kind of evolution um, uh, we think uh, the sustainability will have a front seat in uh, in the future um, but with evolved means and with one very important need Jordana that is uh, that we need to reduce the amount of information that are defining the term sustainability yeah. into one set of rules because sustainability is also efficiency and if we're not efficient in managing sure. sustainability, then we're not sustainable by definition. It's okay. true. So, I uh, love that. that uh, that's a great answer. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Oh, well, well, there is the icebreaker. <laughs> so from Malaysia, Jordana. So after COVID, we, where is the product from manufacturer uh, still playing an important role? For, for example, their brand is Malaysian Leather Good. And um, uh, they think it is important for their product uh, uh, to be manufactured in Italy uh, uh, instead of, um, let's say, investing more uh, in, uh, in, uh, in communication. So um, the, do you think that, uh, for example, a Malaysian brand to keep the same quality should manufacture in account, even if it's global, in a country that is known for uh, 
uh, high quality? I mean, for me, the question is rather, the, the answer is rather obvious, but I would like to, to have your opinion on that. I, I, that's what I was talking about before. I don't think that it's feasible to say that some places in the world will be able to localize everything because they'll be lacking some resources. So I think that my answer, I mean, I hope this is my opinion. I think that, yes, like they should still create, you know, the goods in Italy or wherever it is. Like, I think that if that is going to make the quality and a product better, mm -hmm. um, I, I would say yes. So, right? Michael, I hope your answer has been, uh, your question has been uh, uh, answered. And um, what I would like to say is that uh, we may give some more uh, seconds uh, to see if there are uh, any other um, questions coming in. If not, uh, uh, due also to some time constraints, uh, we will have to close the session, uh, unfortunately, because it's always, uh, it's always very fun. Yeah, it's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> fun. Hopefully, me too. Fun. Hopefully next, I hope that travel does come back, because I do when I come back to Italy. <laughs> oh, and I cannot wait to travel again. I mean, uh, last year, last year this time, I, I would have taken already 80 planes. Now I'm, I took two this year. It's possible. <laughs> I miss it. I want to go, and I love Italy. So I want to eat the the airplane shitty food. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, hilarious. and with this we can conclude. <laughs> so um, it's really, really, uh, Jordana. Let me say it's really always a pleasure to be with you. You too. Uh, I hope to to be in touch soon. Uh, yes. Again. And I, I would also like to uh, thank uh, all the audience of the Lina Pelle Innovation Talks uh, and to um, the audience of Lina Pelle in general. Um, and uh, we will see each other, not with you, Jordana, but with someone who's going to be much boring, much more boring with you. <laughs> because we will be speaking about industrial automation and robotics as a, a, a new um, a model for enhancing production in, uh, in particular in the leather business. Um, and that is going to be next, uh, uh, next, uh, uh, next week, uh, 29. So, Jordana, really, thank you again. And, uh, it was such a pleasure. All of you, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest uh, of the day. Thank you very much. Thank again. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.